told me a long time ago. And if you look for hope, I think you should uh, invite next year someone else <laughs> to talk about hope. He might be also nicer and speak a better English and younger. But I'm not someone to talk about hope, I'm sorry. Uh, thank you for an excellent film. Your analysis already, speaking of perhaps the need of the other, the Arab, who is the second or third class citizen in, in Israel, to identify with the Israelis. It may be a function of identification with the aggressor, which is a psychological phenomenon. Also, it can be, another way of looking at it is, it could be similar to the Stockholm Syndrome. Captives who are kept with the oppressors for a length of time wind up adopting their ways and wanting to become like them. So I think that may explain much more of what's going on than just the simple, not simple, than just what went on with Emir's family. Because I can't see any reason that any Arab would rationally want to go into the IDF. <clears throat> I'm struck by the difference in tone and substance of the talkback from the film. Uh, quite frankly, I think the film leaves a much sweeter impression than is revealed in your conversation. I frankly found it rather, rather unsettling that he went through this entire experience, as you depicted in the film, with no trouble whatsoever, no, no harassment. He goes to Hebron, where surely when he speaks to these settlers and says, I'm a Muslim Arab from Zahdin, you're not just going to smile at him and say, Ahlan wa sahlan. And I'm wondering why you chose to, to present it that way. Because I think without the benefit of this conversation, people would come away with a very, very different impression from what I understand the reality to be based on, on your conversation. Well, I think uh, every you know, uh, impression of every viewer is different. And I can't control that, ever. Um, I can only intend something. And as you said before, I wanted to place a mirror. And you know, paper cut, you don't feel it until afterwards. It's very gentle, but then you realize you're cut. And I think that when Amir's peers tell him, we'll never come to Sakhneen, or after he's done all this job, or when they say, yeah, we want to exterminate all of you, for me, it's quite harsh. So I guess it's how you see. Well. I wouldn't want to be in his place because I don't know if, how, how I would have reacted. I think he reacted in a very smart way because if he would retaliate, he would have held in basic training. But I can tell you that the aftermath of Amir is that now he regrets his service. He regrets going into the army. Um, you talked earlier about education, separate education system. I just wanted perhaps a little clarification from the film where it seemed like he was going to a Jewish, a Jewish Israeli school with Jewish administrators and he's learning in Hebrew, yet it was clear throughout the film that his Hebrew was kind of a Spanglish, you know, like a, a Hebrew Arabic. And I wonder, I guess, more, I'd like more information on his background and how does the father survive economically living in that city with, you know, in social isolation, I guess, and, I, and a little bit more information on how Amir's background educationally led him to the unit that he was serving in and his choice to serve. Um, I'll try to make it short because it's, it's, it's very, very long and these are a lot of different questions. But yes, basically he went to a Jewish school. It's, it's called Jewish, but most of the students are Jews. So among themselves, they speak Arabic, but that's why maybe his language is not you know, so perfect. And he went to that school sent by his father from the same reasons in a way, same social reasons for why his father believes he also needs to go to the army. 
Um, his father makes a living. They're very low class, even though it seems they have a nice house. They're low class. They uh, work in agriculture. And his father was the first Muslim to serve. And they were isolated. But throughout the years, you know, people just accepted it as a fact. So they suspect his father, but they don't harm him anymore. He's just a living fact. And it was the last thing you asked, and I had a good answer for it, but I don't remember the question. Um, forgive me. <laughs> Hi. Um, it's a great film. And it reminded me, actually, of some films in America. Ken Burns did a documentary on World War II. And part of that was he did a number of sections about the Japanese who served in the American Army. And then also I was thinking of the Tuskegee Airmen, the black soldiers who, and in many ways it's interesting because they faced real incidents like where, like the black soldier, at one point, a black airman, they had an emergency land their plane, and the whites and the blacks that they came across couldn't believe that the, the airman was black. So my question is, do you think it's possible that he might change some minds? It sounds like no, but in other words, I, I think the black people and the Japanese people who fought during World War II thought, well, things are really bad now. Clearly, you know, we are not part of America, etc. But if we do this, if we serve in the army, we'll change some minds. And in America, at least, they did. So I was curious if you think in the future that might happen in Israel. Um, first of all, it's a very, very different situation, even though that situation was harsh as well. I mean, fighting the Germans but having separate showers is horrible. Um, but no, I don't think Amir changed anyone during his service. I do think that people, and I'm not flattering myself honestly, but people when they watch the film, something changes. They learn something. They see, oh, this is a nice Arab, you know? He's nice, he's gentle, wow. And he's an Arab, wow, maybe maybe we can be friends, you know? So, basically that's it. Hi, um, thank you both for being here. I think this is a really relevant and timely conversation. And um, I wanted to ask you both, um, this might be more difficult for you, Bidon, but for your ideal vision of uh, circus in Israel and what you think, um, you know, there's a lot of talk just about whether the notion of um, mandatory service to begin with should continue in Israel, and if not, should be abolished completely or replaced by a dual system of national service and military service. Or who would serve, who wouldn't serve, ideal models. This is very easy to answer. The ideal situation is that Israel will have a very, very small army, professional army, will not need a bigger army, and all those questions will become irrelevant. But again, we will meet before it again. In the, in the current, can we talk about the current situation? In the current situation, I think the present situation. I, I, me personally, I can live also without the Haredim in the army. Uh, I don't think that uh, the army needs them, and I don't think that this is worth to go for war about. And uh, I can live with respecting their special needs to study, to be separated. I'm not sure the army is fit to absorb them. It will create many problems about women's service, for example, which for me is much more important, and women's quality, uh, I can live with the present situation and I think we are turning gradually to a more professional army because also in Tel Aviv those who really really don't want to serve in the army in the recent years don't serve in the army, they find all kinds of ways and I think that uh, finally we will get a stage like the American army in which certain social groups will recruit to the army in order to improve their situation, except of elite units which will be uh, still by 
combined by uh, all kinds of uh, groups in the society. And in any case, I think the Israeli army is by far too big and by far plays a too big role in Israeli society. It's above time now that the army, like the fire brigade, like the police, will become one necessary organization in society, but not so much dominant and with much less budget, if I may say. As a filmmaker myself, I was wondering um, how you got so much access into Israeli base. And um, I also was wondering, paradoxically, if the army let you access because at the end of the day, it's not such a bad image that you gave about the whole experience. So isn't it working a little bit against, uh, against the flow? Um. Well, you know, first of all, it's very important to say that uh, he went to the border police and it's a different spokesman than the army. Uh, if he would have gone to a regular unit of the army, I might have not had this access. I came up to the border police and usually when people want to make films, 